time. We got to get enough for now. Now I feel pressure. Yeah. What kind of pressure? Because, like, there's this poor person saying they haven't seen it yet. Don't ruin it, basically. <laughs> and you were, so very poli- they- you were very polite to him. This week, the Jabber John kids went to the moving pictures. We took in the motion picture Civil War, and we will be discussing our varied opinions of this film. It was so nice to get out for an evening with the fellas and our illustrious producer Lex was there with his beautiful family and local rock legend slash film scholar Flash was there with his offspring so it was a delightful evening to be together sharing the bombardment to our senses and emotions. And at the end of the night I got a free bag of popcorn so it was win win win. Join us tonight as we share our thoughts and hopefully receive your thoughts also on this film here the state of current movie making. Lex is very excited about the new Mad Max movie so maybe he can do a little spiel on that for us. I was not even aware there was a new one in the camp but Lex detailing it to me while in the theater lobby got me interested. I know it's beautiful outside so take your laptop out on the lawn and enjoy Jabber John living in living color. As always a 12 caller wins tickets to see Bobby Goldsboro live in Gatlinburg. Goldsboro in Gatlinburg 2024. Frog sitting on a log, one of them fell in. One frog said to the other frog, Well, you better go get her. Two little frogs sitting on a log, one of them fell in. Last little frog he sat and thought, Good thing they can swim. Jabber John, Jabber John, Jabber John. Three little frogs sitting on a log, one burst into a grin. One frog said to the other frog, wonder what's got into him. Two little frogs sitting on a log, one laughed until he is red. Last little frog he sat and thought, must have been something I said. Jabber John. Jabber John. <laughs> and we're live we got a little ghost in the machine over here seems to be uh having a mind of its own so we have two producers tonight lex and the ghost in the machine welcome to jabber john i'm nathan moore this is kyle hogg steve moore at your service welcome to the show so you were telling us a story about your your fish died my fish died dad has had this inexplicable fish for years it seems like that even though it it looks like there's probably nothing alive in the tank, there's always been this one fish that's been in there. And he hides all the time, so I a never. A lot of his thought he was a ghost. He was a it's a it, he was a, an amazing animal, uh, a life force like none I've ever noticed. <laughs> and uh, he has it been I, years? Am I wrong? Is three that... years of by himself in that tank. Uh-huh. It's a 50 gallon tank, you know, we're talking about a big tank. And I it is, I don't take care of it because I, you know, all the fish died. And then one day he was, I found it, he still was alive <laughs> before I could clean it out. And I, so I, I couldn't, I didn't want to fix it back up. I just didn't have the, had the energy. And so right. uh, I just said, well, I'll let you live there and I'm not going to pay any attention to you. And But once a month I'd put some food in there and. I didn't even know he was alive, but Jennifer, my housekeeper, would come in and she knew him and would, you know, give him some love and he'd come out for her. But he he found out for her. Yeah, he did. (laughs) But he uh, left the the world and passed on. So uh, rest in peace. Now I'm ready to clean up my aquarium, Mm -hmm. move on. You going to fix it back up or get rid of it? I, uh, it, 
I'm not going to fix it back up. I'm not able to take care of it. I would like for somebody to take care of it and inherit it eventually, but it'll probably end up in the shed or in the basement <laughs> waiting for that. I mean, I think uh, in my 50 gallon tank, I, I loved, you know, growing up, I always had an aquarium, but you know, during my adulthood, I spent a lot of time and I didn't get like, I'd get tropical fish sometimes. I never did salt water. It was too hard, hard to do all that. But uh, what I would do would be use the native organisms I would catch, I would net out in the, in the creeks. And, right, when you're like hunting for bait and stuff. Yeah, and I'd put different crayfish and different types of uh, minnows and things in there. And, and then I would just study behavior. I would sit there in the evening and, and have the light on and I'd be reading and you could just watch the crayfish come out and hunt mm, and it yeah. was just a, it was like being on the bottom of the ocean. I loved it. Um, so I, I really recommend that for anybody, family with children or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it just takes a little love and caring and it's a great hobby. So I'm going to leave it out for a little while. I have to get somebody to help me get it out in the backyard and clean it out. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure it can be saved at this point. Right. I think it could. Probably could. A 50 gallon tank's pretty expensive, so. Mm -hmm. But I have one in the shed. Nobody's picked it up for a long time. It, it got. I got. I got those uh, aquariums from my old friend I used to teach with, Ned Bonvoy. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bonvoy had those, and I got one from him. But yeah, that was that was an interesting thing. But uh, I, I remember when I was a little kid, I made the fatal mistake of I used to take my goldfish out and play with it. <laughs> <laughs> let it let it sit on the table with oh. me. While <laughs> fatal mistake. Or sadistic know. habits. I don't know what's. The... <laughs> Do you have an aquarium growing up? I used to have a hamster and I'd seal it up in a plastic bag and zip it closed and take it around with me. I didn't know what was. <laughs> That's not true. Is no. it? <laughs> Did you have a hamster? No, I never had a hamster. My niece had a rat, which I thought was terrible. Oh, wow. White one? Yeah, it was like a school project. You know, they had it at school, and during the summer, they said somebody's got to take it, and she ended. Up, she took it, and they raised it for a couple of years. But I was always, they'd bring it to my parents' house, like, get that damn rat here in the house. <laughs> <laughs> but you never had an aquarium or anything. No, no, no. Ant farm. No, I was just always dogs and cat type guy. Mm -hmm. I do like looking at fish though, but uh, you know, I like I'm more. I like to hug something. I'm like you. I want to hug my goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> my little buddy. So what would he do? Just lay there and gasp and flip around? He'd help me with my homework. <laughs> <laughs> no homework to that night, Nathan? My goldfish ate it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What did you do with the fish? Uh, I put him in a, a, a container that had contained the uh, sauce from my lunch and I uh, put him in the freezer and I'm going to give it to Jennifer to bury Sunday. We'll have a service. What size fish was it? Oh, well, he was a black tetra, which aren't very big. He was about that big. He was a big black tetra, but that's just a very common. The tetras are pretty common. Those are, are the, aren't they famous for fighting? Uh, no, those are betas, I think. Uh, but the tetras are famous. Well, they're not famous at all. But <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of Tesla. <laughs> none, of, none of us could name one famous tetra. I don't <laughs> There's not, there weren't any. There, mine was as close, and he's gone. But uh, the neon tetras were the prettiest. That when you go into a aquarium store there they're the ones that have the blue and the red and they shine they're called neon they're real small they just look like little colors floating around oh. they're called neon tetras which are real little the black tetras have a long fin and they're, they're a pretty fit not not anything special except this one was special because he had a nine lives at least at least remarkable fish yeah well, rest in peace little fishy Did you yeah. ever name it Phoenix. 
Because <laughs> he kept arising from the sun. Right. From the ashes. Well, I got my uh, permanent crown put on yesterday. Oh, wow. So you're king, you're king of nothing? What's that? <laughs> so you're the king of nothing? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my first crown. King of pain. What's it like? Now I have a, I, hopefully, I don't know if it'll go. I'm excited because now I'm past the 24 hours that I had to wait before to really chew on that side of my mouth. So for the last few weeks, I've been eating only on the left side of my mouth, which is a pain in the butt a little bit. Yeah, and it's, it's gotten a little lopsided. Yeah, I feel I've a little like yeah, that. Yeah. I can't wait just to bite into something and just use my whole mouth to eat it. Yeah. It was, it was uh, you know, it, all in all, it wasn't that big a deal. So it doesn't really make sense how traumatized by the experience I was. And I look back on it in retrospect. I, I, I wonder why it affected me so deeply. But then, last night I'm looking at Facebook and a wonderful woman here in town, Shannon Harrington. You know her? I don't know who. I've heard her. Great about, people. Yeah. But she, this was her post, and I, I, I'm going to read it real quick just because I couldn't. It, it, it really comforted me so much, and you'll see why. Update. I just got a filling and I'm really upset. Like, I could easily just cry and cry right now. Isn't it weird that normal things can really throw us off sometimes? I mean, people get them all the time, but I'm like sad from it. Does this happen to you? Like, my insides and mind is all freaked out still. I was not scared really, but I did feel dominated by the process, you know? Like, I didn't have the reins at all. It did not hurt, but I was really uncomfortable. But it was really uncomfortable for me because of that, I think. And I don't even mind the dentist. The noise, though, and the fact that I could not run in the middle of it if I wanted to. I bet that is it, big time. Acupuncture can do that to me, too. Like, if I needed to run away right now, I cannot do it because I'm stuck here amid this situation. So that... Uh, it, that takes us right on. into Civil War, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just couldn't believe that someone had this identical experience. And then someone else in the comment section was like, I just had the same experience at the dentist. And I was like, I got to comment. But make that three of us. And thank you for the comfort of this of this post. Just so to, do they give you the shot, the number, or do they give you gas? No, it was, it was weird because she, she said... Uh, most, some people experience discomfort, others don't. Do you want me to numb you? So I'm doing the math in my head real quick. I'm like, well, I don't like the shot where I get numbed and they stick the needle in and wiggle it and stuff. I'm like, on the off chance that I'm not going to experience discomfort, I think I'll just opt for not getting right. the shot because that means there's a path that I'll just get out of here painless. Unfortunately, I was one of the fifty oh, percent. No, unfortunately, I was one of the fifty percent of the people that it was a little. Un uh, I probably could have used the numbing. I pray because it definitely. Oh. I was definitely sensitive, and I'm still cold water is. Oh, yeah. Very. I don't. I don't know if that'll go away or if that's oh. my new state of living, but cold water makes it hurt. <laughs> I'm a little afraid of that. Yeah, I hope that doesn't last. My dentist asks me that every time. I like every six months, that does cold water hurt your teeth? Or I guess that's a common thing. Mm -hmm. do, do they say, and it, but it doesn't. So you... I just say no. So they move on to the next. Mm -hmm. It wasn't doing it with the partial or the temporary that I had for the oh, last wow. couple of weeks. So I'm a little a little nervous that that won't go away. But it does seem less today than it did last night. No, did you get to see it before they put it in there? But like that sip of water is like, I'm like ah, oh, no, no. Oh. <laughs> Am I gonna just have to drink room temperature drinks for the rest of my? I don't know. But there, there was like no ice, please. <laughs> right, I do not want to be that. Water, person. no ice, just water. I've already had to stop chewing ice, which was my favorite thing to do in life for the last, I don't know, for all my life. I've already stopped doing that since this whole teeth thing. I don't know. I don't know what's next. But it was like, it was not like that bad of an experience, but I was overly traumatized by the experience. I, I, 
even I was still in sort of a state of shock when I got home and hearing her des description of it made me feel less insane about it. I was like, well, at least I'm not the only person that you has know, this the, kind of reaction. That lack of control that she was talking about, I, I felt that when I had the MRI. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know, but another part of that was the, uh, with the MRI was the sound. Yeah. And uh, of course, the sound of a, of a electrical device in a dentist office is the worst thing. <laughs> they must, where you go to hell, place in hell to make that sound. <laughs> right. But uh, you'd think they could cover that out in some way, but it just makes it that much worse. But I, I felt that way, the MRA, but sound and it, the whole issue is like she was saying i couldn't escape it right when you're in in the chamber of an mri or you're in the middle of you did you you're not in control of it but that's exactly the way i felt at the movie the other night right right i was gonna yeah. say it's actually a perfect segue <laughs> because the, the first thing i noticed was Where's the volume control? It's too loud in here. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that was the first thing I was assaulted by. Right. Was the noise, I, we, were, we were sitting down front, so maybe it was different <laughs> somewhere else, but I thought the whole movie, I'd, and I can't hear very well. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking if I can't hear very well, and this is too loud for me, what's it like for other people? I right. But I was very uncomfortable with the, and of course a lot of the sounds were things blowing up, so that's a loud sound and a, you know, unpredictable, a lot of, just a lot of racket. But uh, mm -hmm. I, again, I wanted to walk out of there just, Really, what I wanted was a volume control. Right, right. And I, I'm not used to not being able to control the volume. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's just shutting me off right now. Ain't they, anybody that's tired of me? <laughs> and that should be an inalienable, inalienable right to <laughs> shut me <man> off. <laughs> yeah, I felt like the, with the, the cap off the dentist thing, like like it was yeah, sort of. Crown on it. Eh? It was sort of like a <laughs> like a, a metaphor for like the whole being trapped in these bodies, these in, that are undergoing the entropy of age or whatever, and, and it was just like a condensed metaphor for the whole like falling apart of my body and how there's nowhere you can't run, you can't escape, and it's all condensed in this horrific moment of people hovering over me and and stuff in my body and just not wanting any of it. I just oh, want yeah. to be a spirit. I just <laughs> want to float a away, around. I don't know. <clears throat> but I survived. So. I think, I think, I, mean, I really, I thought this every time. I think the dentist should have a clock in front of you because time basically drags. When they're just cleaning my teeth, it probably takes, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. I feel like it's two hours. Like, this right, is never right. going to end. <laughs> How much longer can this go on? But then when I go out to pay the bill, it's like, God, I was only in there for half an hour. They did everything. You know? But when you're sitting there, it's like, oh, my God, like, what's going on? Right, right. <laughs> and plus, you can't see what most anything that's done to you, you can sort of, oh, we're giving you stitches or whatever. You can look at it. There, it's like, oh, right, you, you, you have no... Even. And right, you can't, with the stitches, and you, can't turn you, can, around you can measure how long it's going to take them to finish, <laughs> right? With that, you have no idea what they're even seeing. Yeah, well. Now, weren't you the, were you the one that was telling me that you wore ear pods, or that one? You I wore? tried that the first time. I'll never try that again. Uh, it was just too, I tried wearing, I, I listened to like this new Bob Dylan record, and I was like, speaking of which, there's a new Bob Dylan record that was pretty cool. But I thought that would be enough to like take me out of there and distract me, but it it my noise canceling works too well, and it just all got surreal. It all I, I'm listening to this weird soundtrack. She just said something to the other person, and I heard bleeding, but I didn't hear anything else. And so like I I was like immediately like just taking them out, like wanting to know. I, I was like missing conversations that I wanted to hear, and it was all just. It, it was, I'll never put headphones in at the dentist again. I'd rather just in, endure the whole situation than make it all just weirder, listening to random music and stuff. F Monk, welcome to the show. He wants to know if you're wearing a public image limited shirt. That's a topic of conversation. It's a takeoff on that. It's a spoof. It says ill. My good friend Stephanie Spencer got this for me. 
So, good eye. It's very much a public image limited T-shirt. What, what are they like? What, Beastie Boys. What, Ill. what do you think the artist is saying with that, or what's the idea there? Just how cool I am. Is it, <laughs> is it a spoof though? Does ill mean something? Is well, it, I think it's like, like Beastie Boys, ill communicator, and you know, mm. just a hip thing to be. Ill. <laughs> that is hip. Grimes is ill, isn't she? Hmm? Isn't Grimes ill? Yeah, she's ill. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ill? I guess we're not. <laughs> no, this show is ill. This show's ill? Mm -hmm. Sweet. Actually, Jammer John would be a perfect thing to show at the dentist. Why is that? Just p sitting there watching three guys talk. You wouldn't want to watch the dentist episode, but <laughs> you, it would be... Wait, a... go ahead. Something, everything's cool up there? I think he's probably just barking at something outside. I smell food. Yeah, that cut the oven off. Bacon was bacon. <laughs> is everything, good. Is everything all right? I smell food. <laughs> I'm, I'm running up there if there's food ready. Percy could be barking at me, burning the bacon. That's completely plausible. Do you need but me I'm to pretty, go and check on that delicious yeah. food you had that I smell? I'm pretty sure I cut the oven off. You might want to satisfy my OCD because I, I can never be sure. So, welcome to another uh, movie review edition of Jabber John. The first time we did this was we all watched the movie Barbie together. And uh, that was really fun. That was our first review show. Go back in the archives and check it out if you'd like on our YouTube channel, Nathan Moore Songs on YouTube. And uh, so this week, we all went out to the theater together and saw the new movie Civil War. And so we are now going to discuss the movie Civil War. And we're not going to worry about spoilers, so spoiler alert, there will be spoilers. We're just going to talk freely about the movie, whatever we thought of it, and uh, not worry about spoilers. So I, I feel like with this particular movie, there's not a lot to spoil. There's, there's no mysteries, there's n and, and unless you want to go in cold like I did, I did go in pretty cold to this movie. Um, unless that's your desire, I don't think you have a lot to worry about with this. It's not a whodunit or any mysteries or anything like that. So with that being said, anybody want to start us off? I don't want to start, <laughs> no. The sound was definitely a, a huge thing. Like the, that was the, all the jump scares were this silence interrupted by this very, jolting startling loud gunfire or bombs or whatever it was yeah it was the type of noise too it wasn't mm -hmm. but just it was too loud but it was also so violent mm -hmm. the type of noise it was was not anything but hurtful to my ears right but i can sort of consider that on purpose like that's the way a war area would be it would be loud and you know disturbing and you know yeah and i uh, mm -hmm. um but they still didn't have to have it that loud. <laughs> Especially with the way the dialogue was mixed. All the all the non battle parts were quiet. They were like right. a normal volume, which you would expect. You could hear it, but it wasn't too loud in those moments. Someone even took notes. <laughs> and then bam! All of a sudden <laughs> Jump scares. Most of the jump oh, yeah. scares were audio for sure. I like this. Kyle is taking some notes. Man, I really, I, I really overthought this movie. Oh, good. Oh, good. Some, one of us had to. <laughs> well, go for it. Tell us what you got One there. of the things I noticed, and this just might be my particular um, viewpoint that I missed a bunch, but anybody that was doing anything productive and normal was a woman. Hmm. Like uh, the campsite director when they pulled up was a woman told them where to go to camp. The reporter that was with the army in Charlottesville, dressed in the military fatigue, she was a, that was a woman. The uh, leader of the army that killed the press at the end, that was a woman. <laughs> the woman that ran the store was what, a woman. Well, wait a minute. Now, you, were, you said anybody that does anything constructive. All the men were killing each other and being hateful. But the women, the woman that... Uh, the black wo young black woman that shot the president, that was something positive. Well, she was in, well, no, <laughs> but, but she, she was in control of the mission. Mm. Everybody else was just running around shooting, yeah. you know. And so the, the woman at the stores, the dress stores seemed totally normal. 
the president's Not press really. secretary at the end came out trying to, she was trying to save his life, but tried to talk some sense into him. Um, so it's like almost the men were just like the gas station guys stringing up people in the car wash and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, it, I, and that might just be me when I started trying to think of what to say, but I can't think of any guy that was doing anything good. Mm -hmm. Well, I would follow well, the it. reporter. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, the two, besides the main characters, right. they were good people, but. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't, I, I didn't see a whole lot of good people. I thought I saw a lot of innocent people, but I didn't see a, I mean, and I think they, one of the things that the movie intentionally didn't do was try to create that boundary line. They were trying, I think they were trying to not make us matter at each other, but to make us all realize how it would be how horrible it would be if it comes to where it could go if if we let it. Right. Right. But I don't think they were trying not to make one side right and one side wrong, and that was a whole part of the movie, which of course made it in some ways unrealistic. In mm -hmm. some moments, they just it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have been like that. Right. You know, that's was my thought. It, it, no, it wouldn't be like that. Oh. Well, maybe I use the word good. The women were doing productive things, running a store, directing traffic, right. getting stuff done. The men were just shooting each other. And well, there you go. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say that's probably done. That's a good observation. Uh, and then another observation that I had was along with that, I think is what we were talking about what they were going for was that, you know, they were in West Virginia and they were in different places in the, the camps. You saw the blacks and the whites together. Everybody was getting along. So they were trying to make the point that it wasn't a black-white thing, too. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't about that. So they were careful to give characters uh, of each side black they and white They also alluded a little bit to, like, the when the guy with the red sunglasses oh yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah i mean what that kind would, of american are you kind of? oh yeah i mean they were saying it's a problem but they were trying not to identify it but it wasn't a race war yeah for sure right they were trying to say that but they're also saying it's they were trying not to create the, the boundaries they're trying to stay away from the boundary because mm -hmm. that what would that accomplish but even out of the gate how they had the the Western Front that was up against this this despotic president. I mean, it seems like the president was a bad person. Like, there was never any hint that there was, like, he was in his third term. He had done drone strikes on American citizens, and there was, and he seemed like a mess. Like yeah. every time we saw him, I mean, there was there was no redeeming qualities that they showed there. He eliminated the FBI. Eliminated yeah. the FBI exactly. And the in the Western forces was California and Texas. Yeah. Which, which if you're playing to the modern day culture wars, they would be the two represent the two sides. Right. That was an extent. attempt to just not go there. Mm -hmm. I thought very very not even subtle. That's that's what they were trying to say that uh, this is not about that. This movie's not about that issue of who's right and who's wrong. Right. Yeah. It's about what you would we would all experience if it comes to that. Mm -hmm. Which is the age old thing, if war is hell. Right. And people can glorify it all they want, but there's nothing pretty about it. So I get that. Right. And I don't have to have it thrown over my head <laughs> too loudly in a theater. <laughs> well, something, right. this, again, this is me overthinking everything, but one of the first songs that comes on when they're driving is a song by a group called Suicide, which I thought, Basically, this whole movie was America committing suicide. Mm. The song they did was called Rocket USA, which is basically what they were doing, blowing up the United States. And Suicide was a band, two guys, so it's like the good side and the bad side, that were just an aggressive, confrontational band. There's like CDs, live CDs of them. All they do is taunt the crowd. Like the guy in the back just playing the keyboards, and the guy out front's like, "You suck," you know, "Fuck you," and they're yelling. The crowd's yelling back at him. So I thought that was a beautiful song to play. Just how that all tied in a suicide. Basically, we're all we're doing is killing each other, like killing ourselves, basically. 
that was just a two-man band, Rocket USA. I thought that, and again, that's me overthinking everything. No, but that's, that was, no um, that's you with the music facts. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, you that know, they, that's, I mean, if, that's fascinating. if anybody overthinks a movie, it's the movie makers. Right. Like, everything's intentional. Right. I don't think you're over, you can't overthink stuff like right. that because it's all done on purpose, for right. sure. They, and they, that's probably the, some of my favorite imaginings of people making movies is how they sit around and talk about the smallest, right. how the little thing sitting on the table represents, oh, yeah. yada, yada, yada. Like, the, they, everybody goes deep when they're making yeah. that stuff. They love you for noticing. And I think <laughs> there was probably a lot of that kind of stuff in there that you don't catch the mm -hmm. first time you watch it. Some yeah. of the visual images were, the, were pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. That if you took, they were like photographs on it. Well, the whole thing, a whole lot of it was about photography mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, and how you can get addicted to that type of thing. Uh, that's one little subtle thing that's running all the way through. Right. I mean, why in the world do you want to go on, take pictures of people being shot tw 20 feet away from them? Because, you know, you know you're risking your life to do it, so. Right. Uh, that's a whole special thing. And in an thing. interesting way, like the the photo the wartime photojournalist is like a, a noble way to experience the same adrenaline rushes of just being in the fight. Yeah. And it's, it's a way to stay above and be in exactly. the, that fix, that adrenaline fix. The adrenaline fix, yeah. <clears throat> Another overthinking thing, I thought... The photography was great because the photographer's job is not to tell you a story, it's to present the images, which I think is what the whole movie did. It didn't tell us a story, I it just presented oh, the images. I like that, because mm -hmm. I, I thought about that too. Like, well, if, if the first thing is, how, how can it, how can it uh, be a, uh, uh, what are we saying when we talk about things before? The idea that the things are gonna be told here that, Spoiler. Like, yeah. I mean, what are we spoiling here? There wasn't a plot. Right. When you really boil it down, uh, there wasn't really a plot. And the characters, I thought the character of the girl was absurd. The, the, the young girl? <laughs> the young girl. The, the young girl's character, the way they developed it in the movie. I don't mean her character was absurd. I mean, the, the, whole, the, the whole thing of it uh, was, was just... Uh, I don't know, it wasn't developed. and that, That's not what they were interested in. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of movies are interested in. Um, for instance, uh, and you know, maybe I'm hung up on this, but uh, because I do think about it, I used to think about it a lot, is, is the idea of the, how do you relate into that movie uh, sex? There weren't any. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is, again, that's their choice. They chose that there would be no sexual tension in the whole movie because we've got all this other tension to deal with. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was, you know, I'm trying to analyze why they go where they go, right. the filmmakers. And so I'm looking at that and saying, you know, they just didn't want to be bothered with it. Like when that girl walked around to the back, I was just, and that guy followed her. Uh, exactly. I thought there was going to be a sexual scene, mm -hmm. but they were, it was really, I was really glad there wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. but I was glad that it uh, didn't go, but where they went was even worse. Mm -hmm. I don't want to even talk about that, but uh, yeah, that's not mm -hmm. a spoiler. That'll get them people to watch it. That's so. true. But yeah, that was horrible to see. Mm -hmm. what, and I, I don't need to ever see that once. Right. And that's the filmmaker's fault. And I blame him for that. Mm -hmm. He did that to me. But you know, they do it all the time. They did it on baseball games. Where they, they come in and show you the horrible things some little girl is doing in their latest California movie, you know, of, uh, of horror movies. And what are you doing? You're just trying to get the adrenaline going. But you just showed me an image of something horrible that is in my head now. Mm -hmm. You invaded my head and I didn't want you to do it. I was trying to watch a baseball game. Right. And you have that image in my head? Now, I paid money and went to this thing, so I'm responsible. Right, that's I'm, not. <laughs> I'm not blaming them for anything, but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, th that ties into my last point, how they took special, in my opinion, they took special, uh, they tried to show you like the beauty of regular life. There's one scene they're shooting and there's some out of focus flowers 
and you see the flowers come and focus in front of the one guy, and then it goes back and the flowers come and focus to the other guy. Mm -hmm. I noticed that. That's um, beautiful. When the old when the old black guy was dying, he dies in this beautiful fire with the, you know, the the sparks were gone. It made it almost like he was like a Roman hero, you know, just. The beauty of that scene was really cool. I thought that was nice. Uh, when they were trying on the dresses, a most normal everyday thing, but it was just so, like a, like they, I mean, the, like you look beautiful when you smile. They just that seems so normal. It's like they tried to show you that even when all this bad stuff's going on, you got to pay attention to the, you know, the little good things. Well, how make. much you should appreciate. Right. Yeah. Right. Notice the <laughs> notice the good things around you. Yeah. Can we talk about how that town that that store was in reminded me of North Korea? Oh, wow. I went home and came to that conclusion. How, how's that? Just that it's like you could tell there was an oppressive force there. That's how it came across to me. And that they're made to, we are going to keep this thing going normal. We don't, I don't want nobody acting up. I don't want anybody acting unnormal. Keep right, driving your cars, right. walk, go, everybody play. You know, and but they were, I don't know. It, it was just I thought like, that was, it was such like a strange. A, it was like a fake happy, you know, right. or something. You know, I thought that was such yeah. a strange scene well, a in that point. sense because you couldn't tell. Um, so, so what we're talking about is they. So basically, just since we're doing spoilers, should I bring Percy down? I'm a little distracted by it. I, can't, yeah, I, I, keep, I keep thinking it'll stop at any point. I'm just but. wondering if a bear came in. First, he's saying, stop telling him what happened in the movie. <laughs> he's the spoiler police. <laughs> please, please, stop. <laughs> there are people that want to be with you tonight that haven't seen the movie yet. This is breaking my heart. Oh. Should we try to call him down? Percy! anything or not but uh so basically like what what's what's going on in this movie is it starts out the war is just full-fledged it's on now for me that that was a little disappointing because i didn't study the movie going in and i was looking forward to a movie that was showing me how a civil war might start in america like that was the thing that was fascinating to me. Like, how are they going to tell this story? The, what's how how could they make it plausible? Right. And I, I even like ten minutes in, I still thought any minute now they're going to say a year ago. I thought that text was going to come up on the screen. They were going to cut back to a year ago to show me how all this started and how right. it all, and they very very purposefully didn't do any of that. And that sort of drove me crazy because I've seen enough dystopian war movies and stuff that for me it's not that hard to imagine how horrific and terrible it would be if if it happened here. Right. Just take any of the other movies I've seen and put them in. Like, like it, I, it didn't give me new stuff to think about. It was definitely a visceral experience of it that, of course, you think about, but it wasn't intellectually anything I hadn't thought about before. There were no new ideas right. in that sense. So I was a little bit sad, although Catherine and I came home and talked about it for the rest of the night, and she was like, I don't think I want to see the movie you were hoping for. <laughs> like, because her fear is that if they had made the movie I'm looking for, too many people would treat that as like a how-to, as like a manual of how. I think they were very aware, well aware that they didn't want to go there mm -hmm. and tried not to. It's sort of fascinating how hard it would be to tell any version of that story that wouldn't be exploited on social media and right. stuff like that well, yeah. As, yeah. as a way to drive the wedge between... Exactly. That's, That's what's kind of perfect about the execution of this non-story. Right. right. You know? Now, did it seem... Mm -hmm. We, on the way home from the movies, we were sort of talking about how it's almost too current. Like, it's like, oh, like we were saying, oh, my God, I hope some freaks don't see this. And like, oh, this is the way it needs to be. You know, it was almost like, oh, you should have waited a couple of years or something to make it. It was almost like, you know, right off the skillet, here you go. I like, oh, no. That's just, you know. I, I mean, the good news is is that the, the few people that would see that movie and be like, like, 
want anything they see right. in the movie. There's it's like two people. Like <laughs> there, there, it's not right. a faction of ideology that right. exists in our culture wars right. in the state like that. Nobody, nobody wants that. Right. That is that is not what they picture. Except Trump. <laughs> I don't, he what? doesn't want that. Except he, Trump. He, he, he doesn't want that. He definitely no, doesn't want I'm that. I'm just kidding. I found it fascinating that they. Um, but come back to me. I don't have this thought for the fully formed yet. Oh, so all right. So I was about to say, like, so basically. It starts off the. It's like a, a year and a half in. It's a, it's a full on. It's all all full swing. The the civil war is happening, and in fact, the Western forces are, gay are the front line of the battle is coming all the way from Texas and California, and the front line is Charlottesville, Virginia. Like basically Stanton. Like right. basically we're on the front line here, and. Uh, these reporters decide are, are trying to get an interview with the president before DC falls. So they're traveling from New York to DC and then it's a road movie. So it's just them trying to make it to DC and then these little scenarios along the way that they run into on their travel. So it's, it's a road film that, that then ends in DC and, uh, so the, at one point, they're in this little town where, it, you know, everywhere else they've been, it's just bombs blasting, bullets flying, sort of mayhem. Refugee and then this camps. little town, they come in, and it's still, like, operating like normal. And there's this little clothing store that they go into, and the ladies there just, like, reading a magazine, and they try on some dresses and stuff. But then when they come back outside, the old old dude... Is like, all right, don't make any quick moves or anything, but just notice the rooftops. And she sort of glances around, and there's men with guns on all the rooftops. What did y'all... So there's two ways of seeing that. One is that's the town just defending itself. But those are just local townspeople protecting themselves. But the way he was like, don't, don't be obvious, right. but check out the rooftops made him feel way more ominous and oppressive, like he was saying, more like a North Korea thing, like the town was being forced to pretend like things were normal. What What was your impression of? I didn't get the same impression that uh, Lux did at all. I, I thought that was very interesting to hear his side of that. But I just thought that, that what they were saying, that there were pockets of civilization that hadn't been touched by it and were pretending and and there were two different illusions during the movie to people that uh, were living in a ranch in Colorado for instance and then pretending, it's pretending not it's not happening, not happening right? yeah so that I think that was they were but my take on it it was that uh, they were it, it looked to me like a, a an empty street in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. I, I thought they were in Charlottesville right. in the way they, they I was a little confused geographically yeah, where so they were I, coming so from. So they didn't say it ever was Charlottesville, obviously, but I felt like that's what they were saying, that there were pockets like that in Charlottesville or wherever. It didn't have to be Charlottesville, but that's where they were heading, so I had that in my head. But the idea being that uh, there were places that... The, that uh, Fighting had not touched, which would be make sense. Your fighting's yeah. going to be fought not all in every street, but in certain places where the forces are congregated. So the big cities were all a mess, and uh, but the, a lot of the, I mean, we've got a lot of people out there in the country that just are not necessarily tuned into all that. Which so, is the way it would be. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But I'm, I'm like you. I I didn't think of it the way he. I, it's very fascinating what you said about North Korea. I I looked at it as they were on the rooftops watching the reporters, making sure they didn't mess anything up. But then when you think, when I think about what you said, it's sort of true. Like we don't want any of y'all messing up. We're watching every single one of you. To right. Make sure. Right. Yeah, I could see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I would have just default thought that that was the town protecting themselves right. and that they were just That's up there first, giving cover and they could see if anything was coming or right. whatever so the town could up. But 
the way he said, don't let them like check out the rooftops, but don't make it obvious right. was ominous. Right. right. So he felt threatened by them. And then there was that very interesting exchange of like how she was, how she said that to her, like this town, that little moment in that town represented everything she'd forgotten. And mm -hmm. then the black man says, well, to me, it reminds me of everything I remember. Which was an interesting yeah. little right. observation. Yeah. Yeah. So tell everybody what you said when we first got out of the movie and we're standing on the sidewalk. Oh, yeah. It, it reminded me of, <laughs> it was self centered me. It reminded me of my divorce. It was just like, <laughs> what in the world's going on here? And I can't make sense of it. And that one scene where he was just, there was like loud music or bombs and he's just like screaming. He was like, that's when I, mean, I remember my wife would just wouldn't explain what was going on, and I would just go down the base, but ah, like stop, everything happening. I don't know what's going on. Like he was just like this, like the that main guy was like, just the world has to slow down, just make sense for a second. It was, it was almost like if you just drop down in that situation, and like, like we're all trying to put a plot to it or try to figure stuff out. You're like, just please let me catch my breath for 10 minutes and figure out what's going on. They didn't really, like you said, they were just on the road moving. They never had a chance. And that was another thing I thought was nice when they went to that camp and stayed and they were all smoking joints and drinking some booze and stuff. It's like, oh my gosh, it was just so nice. It's like you said, the blacks and the whites were all together. Everybody just had like, a good time. Kids were playing. Time. Yeah, it was just like, oh my God, just how a moment's peace is so you know, it can be just, <laughs> they weren't doing, they weren't in any luxury hotel or any vacation spot. It was just so nice to lay back and talk to friends and, you know, relax for a second. Which really does highlight how easy it is to take just normalcy for granted mm -hmm. and how grateful we should be for it every moment that like this, what we're doing right now in that movie would have been depicted as just what a beautiful, <laughs> uh, blessed, well, blessed thing that you have just to be able to. I had that experience twice that day. And one was uh, they had to come out and turn off my electricity mm, to, do, to do my work on the house. And uh, so I went without any power for about eight hours and I survived. But it was close. <laughs> that was the day we went to the movie, too, wasn't it? Yeah, but yeah that's what I'm Which getting. Which is interesting. You know? The fish so, didn't survive, but you did. I survived. <laughs> but, yeah, but at the end of the day, you know, because all day I'm there and they're working and everything went well, and at the end of the day they left, and all of a sudden I could watch TV again, and my chair would go back to where I wanted it to do. <laughs> And, um, oh, it was stuck and, in an awkward and, position, right? Exactly. Because it's electric. And oh, exactly, wow. exactly. I couldn't sit in my chair. TV didn't work. And I didn't open the refrigerator because I didn't want everything to melt. So oh, right. I was, when they left and the electricity came back on, I thought it was the most wonderful day of my life. <laughs> and then later that evening, when I realized that that movie was over, <laughs> I had that same feeling. I think, oh my God. So once again, five this, stars for the ending of the movie. Yeah, it was five stars. It, I, it's quiet. I can hear myself talk. And uh, there's the explosions, because the last 30 minutes just went on and forever, it seemed like. Mm -hmm. Just blow up in Washington, D.C. and let's go to some plot or something. Right. But just kept killing people. I got tired of it, mm -hmm. and, but it, then it was over, <laughs> and y'all lights came on. Y'all were all right, and we, I, <laughs> I, now, could, I could go home and the TV worked. So it was a beautiful day. I didn't even understand. Like I understand it, I like the iconography of it. How when they first get to DC and there's this huge fight going on at the Lincoln Memorial, and I under I mean Lincoln, the original Civil War. It's such a noticeable endeared monument to our culture so symbolically i completely understood why that was be sure. but strategically and logistically i didn't understand it at all like if you've been to the lincoln memorial who are they shooting at uh. <laughs> it's not a military base or a headquarters or even an office building it's just uh 
Right, I do believe that, so. but it seemed like such a focus. Like there was all these artillery thing. Like it was seemed like I, I, did, I couldn't get my brain around exactly who would have been there, except for just a few people with with something. But that was a little strange. Well, it was me. definitely. I think the, to give it that size of a of a battle scene at that location was purposely symbolic. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it's definitely was definitely symbolic and powerful of, of just like the ultimate. It'd be like the Statue of Liberty coming down or something right. like that. Just something. Oh, oh, go ahead. Well, <laughs> talking about the Statue of Liberty. This has nothing to do with the movie, but it has to do with movies. I just read that the original Planet of the Apes, the humans weren't supposed to survive. What do you mean? You know when the 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 the, the the, the astronauts land, it's the planet of the apes, you know, and they go, the, and there's the Statue of Liberty, you know, up on the beach, you know, it's falling over. And the original planet of the apes, all those astronauts were supposed to die. So, like, the apes that just, you know, were, they didn't have to worry about humans anymore. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Tying that in Statue of Liberty. Spoiler. Spoiler. <laughs> if you haven't seen Planet of the Apes made in 1968. <laughs> now, I don't want to say what he said, but what did you think that, the last thing the president said was that cowardly, cowardly, or was that? It mean, almost summed up that he was like a bad guy from what he said. I don't remember anything special except that. Should we turn the mics down and reveal it to each other? <laughs> sure. You don't remember it either. That. All right, we're back. And we're back. I think that would be pretty normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't see anything out of line there. One thing that's interesting is he said it to the journalist who maybe did have the power to save him. Maybe not. But <laughs> there is a little bit of a pl pl plausibility that if he's the one idea in that moment that could have been like, as a journalist, because it's a war crime. Now, to me, it wrapped up, and I'm not talking bad about Trump at all. I'm just going to say this. It remind me of this. When Trump said never surrender, and he has that photo of himself turning himself in, this mug shot, it's like, dude, you just surrendered. You know, never surrender. Here I go. I'm surrendering. <laughs> and so this guy, the president, doing all this stuff he was doing in the movie, and then at the end, he's just like begging, oh, at the end, he's, you know, whatever. It was almost like <laughs> you never, you're not living up to what you were, you know. I mean, I would hope if I passed, if I was going to die and I'd been fighting in a war and they caught me, I wouldn't say what he said. I hope, I hope I'd be like, you know, F you, then let him shoot me instead of, you know, what he said. Mm -hmm. I just thought it sort of made, that. I just thought it made the president seem weak and not really 100% behind his ideals. Well, there was, so never, was never any special need. I mean, they didn't try for one minute to make him sound like a, like you said, you right. assumed he's a bad guy, but right. not really, I mean, there was not really any statement of that. They didn't go there. Right. They, but were, it, but they even, weren't but trying but he, to portray him as anything right, like but that. But even bad guys can have a spine and, you know, believe in their badness. Mm -hmm. well, even brave people can know they're about to be killed and ask <laughs> not to have it happen. <laughs> well, we've already said it's a spoiler-riddled episode, so. All right, so. I, I appreciate it, you wanting to it sounds like, the It sounds like it sounds like our the opinions of the movie. It was the the. If I had just gone to see it as an action adventure movie, I'd have been like, "That's pretty cool. The the visuals were cool, but." I don't know. It was just sort of messed up. I don't know. It was a well-made movie. Yeah, I'd definitely say that. It, 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 it apparently was made for fifty million. And it looks maybe yeah. more expensive than that, even with all the. Well, I would like to say that when I was thinking about what we would do tonight, I wanted to make sure everybody knows that I don't think I'm a part of the demographic here. I don't. I don't think they made that movie for me. And uh, they they don't really care. What much, do you think there is a demographic for it? Oh yeah. I feel like they made it w hoping everybody would watch it and just let the conversations flow from uh, there. Yeah, well. But it's an election year. It's like. Okay. Yeah, 
Well, I, I think they were trying to uh, make an appeal. I think, I, yeah, they, they could be trying to appeal to everybody, but they didn't make it. Um, um, I don't know. I think a lot of the movies made today are, are graphically sensationalized to where they don't need as much other stuff like plots and, right. and, and dialogue yeah, and was, actual was char- really sad and character them. development. Right. Yeah, you don't get any of that. So that's what a, they they didn't, they weren't after that, obviously. I was so upset by the lack of that, but the more I advocated for it, the more I got pushback that I sort of appreciated too, that the, the more, because like, come on, dialogue? We can't have like some dialogue here? <laughs> but apparently if there had been dialogue... That might have yeah. defeated the purpose of the movie. And, and, and that goes level. back to the sex thing and everything else. You don't want to, that to interfere with what they were trying to do. Mm-hmm. But again, that makes the, me not part of their demographic because I didn't like what they were trying to do. I wanted something more realistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I wouldn't have liked it if it had taken sides. I'm not saying that. Right. I don't want to create <laughs> well, the problem. That's something I was going to write down too. Like you said, you wanted it to be more realistic, meaning more of a plot. What? What? Do you think our lives have a plot? I think. Do you think? Uh, do, you, do you think the world has a plot, or we just make up our own plots so we don't go crazy? I think we all make up our own plots as we go along, but we all have plots, and we all have plans, and we all have plots we'd like to think are in. You know, we create plots in our head that we think are real, and sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't. And a lot of times they're partly real, and mostly things we would like things to be. You know, so much of it is how we would like the world to be. Right. When we describe what we think the world is, it's not the way it is now. Um, well, I was talking to a friend about it, and I was about it's about not much of a plot, and I started thinking. What is a plot, really? It's like, what is the plot of my life? It's just something I've made up that probably ignores 96% of whatever's going on in my life. Like, if I was going to tell somebody, this is the plot of my life, they'd go, well, you left this part out and this part out. You didn't explain this. You didn't. It's like almost like a plot is something we build with the information we have <laughs> to, to put us on a forward journey somewhere. Yeah, that's a good definition of a plot. Mm-hmm. Right. But, you know, as a writer and you're creating something with a plot, it's just like a a song. Some songs tell a story and some songs don't do anything but try to capture a moment and some just want to capture an emotion. But some have a plot. They're called ballads and they tell a story. And Mm -hmm. And some, you know, some Dylan songs tell a story. He's a good storyteller, right. mm-hmm. but, now, but some of them are just songs. <laughs> so I guess the plot of Civil War is four photo, four journalists have to get from New York to D.C. in the midst of an ongoing American right. Civil War, right? And it's sort of up yeah. to you. The head of the army that's trying right. to kill the president. Get to get there before the army does, right. They kind of won't spoil, but through some dialogue they explain... Once that happens, what will happen to the loyalist states that D.C. and Virginia right. and all of them are a part of? Mm-hmm. They were all the loyalist states to the president. So sh- Which were the loyalist states? If y'all talk some more, I'll pull up a map that I found. Oh, yeah. That shows what's, what they're depicting in the movie as far as the territory. Because it wasn't just Texas and California and then... Florida, Florida is that strange yeah, little. Alliance. It's the way they make it sound yeah. like is Florida is seceding in its own right, <laughs> not even related to the Texas California they thing. They have their own rebellion, but it's not against Texas or California, so they're working together. And then there's this, um, the, the new something, and and it's f- from like what it's like all the upper west. So from Washington through the Dakotas, Wyoming, but then like it includes Utah as well. Um, but then like from Colorado, yeah, from Colorado, straight line almost all the way to Virginia or South Carolina is um, loyalist states. 
Mm -hmm. then the Florida Alliance includes Florida and everything of the southern states up to Texas. Loyal to who, though? The president? <coughs> so you're yeah. talking, what you're talking about is the fiction behind the story. Right. So it's not anything real that we're right. talking no, about. No, no, no. But it's interesting that they... Did they show that in the movie? Like that, you know, I never saw that in the movie. Mm -mm. Or no, you got it on Google. Some pe I think the I think the <laughs> I think the production company put put it out as part of their marketing stuff at some. Oh point. really? Yeah, I think so. So there's some fiction related to the movie that the right like Alex Garland and his team disseminated to complement. I guess so. I mean, I kind of did the same thing you did and avoided knowing much about it mm -hmm. but in some of the stuff that i've been reading afterwards some of these articles came out before the movie was released and was talking about how he was going to avoid telling a story we would have known that much he might have edited all that ahead. stuff out too you know now, the, what, what, what did your kids think of it did they just tell you what they thought from that, no, their they age point lot. of view they lucy was very lot. inspired to go get more earnestly involved in her, her civics classes. Yeah, she did say that. On the <laughs> to way try home. to prevent such a thing from ever happening. Well, that's, really a good, that's a good outcome of the movie. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is a good outcome of the movie. Well, maybe it was just showing, like, look, if we don't all get our act together, this could very realistically be what we're living with. Well, I think that's exactly years. what they were trying to do. Mm -hmm. Anti-war movie all the way. Yeah. And, and that's why I think it's important that I not... I'm not saying don't go see it. You know, I don't want people to get that impression from anything I say. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the issues I have, I mean, I just don't like war movies. Right. I don't like gratuitous violence. But that, again, I'm just an old fart, and that's the way I feel. I'm very sensitive. I feel like this, too. I'm a, I'm a sensitive new age guy. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like just to think you're not part of the demographic is like I mean when I think of when I think of demographic I think of that there's an audience that it will it will appeal to and I feel like this movie in particular the idea that it has a demographic is maybe a little different than most movies I don't feel like he was trying to make a movie that appealed to anybody like he he, well, he wants us. He wants everyone to see it to have a complete aversion to everything about it. That's no a, matter where you're coming from. Did a damn good job of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I tell you, yeah. I don't. I hardly ever watch movies anymore. Were any of those actors famous? Like the lead. Well, the Kirsten yes. Dunst. I learned something today that I didn't know. The the guy in the red sunglasses, who's one of my favorite actors, actually. Right. Yeah. His name is what? Plebbins. J Jesse Plemons. J Jesse Plemons, who's a great actor. First saw him in Friday What's Night Lights. Him? What's that? What else has he played well, in? Well, Friday Night Lights is where he got his start. Huh. Have you ever watched Friday Night Lights? No. You might enjoy that. It's all centers around the high school football coach. Right. I've, I've seen one or two, but I don't, yeah. I don't get the channel again. Mm -hmm. But uh, he uh, and Kirsten Dunst, the lead, are probably the two mm -hmm. most famous people. In, but they're married. Those two are? Yeah, I did uh, not know that. Hmm. Did you know that, Lex? Yes. Ah. And yeah. somebody else was supposed to play that part. Apparently, Jesse Plemons was called in at the last minute to come in and play that role. Oh, I wow. Think, not even at the suggestion of Kirsten Dunst, I don't believe. It was somebody else on the team, another producer maybe, or some, I can't remember who, but... And he came in and, and did that. He's too good. Yeah. That was a very unsettling scene, and yeah. his acting definitely sold it. He's really too good at that. And that that was another scene, like just like the gas station scene, where she was bent down on the, on the, with the other guys. And I was like, oh, my God, there's going to be some horrible rape scene or something going on here now. It was always like... You just like fear, like don't let anything happen to these poor women, you know. These guys are all out of control maniacs. Mm -hmm. uh. You know, the the consistently when I, I I watched a couple of reviews of the movie and interviews with Alex Garland and everybody keeps talking about it as a love song to journalism. A love letter to journalism. And I don't I don't necessarily get that. Like, I don't either. Like to me, like it wasn't. It didn't extol the virtues of journalism. It almost displayed the futility of 
even her, even Lee Miller, who apparently is a faint, very famous. Oh, her character's her. name is is actually a famous female war photojournalist from World War Two. Was Lee Miller referenced in the movie as well? But that's an actual character. Um, Can I mention something real yeah, quick? Yeah, please. Lee Miller is one of my favorite people in the history of the world. The real Lee Miller. She oh, was a you knew it going she in. She was a Vogue model. She went Man Ray dated her, took a lot of photographs of her. But she's got a very, very hugely famous photograph. Once Hitler died, she went and got in Hitler's bathtub with her boots. You just see her army boots on the outside and her in the tub. And if you remember, there's a scene, Lee Miller in the movie is in a tub resting in the tub. Oh, yeah. oh wow. And I was like, damn, that's exactly from that photograph that's... of her. Oh, good eye. Yeah. Good job. Good eye. You're crushing <laughs> oh, that. good eye. Yeah. yeah, people learn to help learn. <laughs> but is, so what do y'all think about this idea that the movie was lauding, the, exalting the value of journalism? The value of journalism? I didn't, I didn't see that they were pulling that off. It, it seemed like part of the no plot. Like mm -hmm. the, the, I didn't think that was developed well, and uh, the way it ended wasn't effective. And uh, uh, it, it, to, to me, it felt it, 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 like they were just uh, trophy hunters, or mm -hmm. you know, they were adrenaline junkies. Adrenaline junkies, something that they were hooked on, and ne you know, needed to get. Uh, go to some therapy to get not be like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I didn't see them as, as a healthy hero in the movie at all. And she any... even says at one point because the Lee Miller, the lead character of the movie, was a well-known war journalist in this movie that it was famous for traveling to war-torn countries or where war was raging and, and taking pictures of it. And she said that she felt like she'd spent her whole life trying to send home warnings to not let this ever happen at home, and that she had, her whole life was a failure. Like, and it all the way she her character sort of just crumbles at the end. Right. And then, in a way, it seems like she sort of kills herself yeah. to mm -hmm. save the young journalist or whatever, and then just stands there and takes the bullet. That's a spoiler, for sure. Yeah, that was. But the whole thing like seemed more of a sad commentary on the futility of of it all on, in that respect. Which so th then when I hear Alex Garland talking about how he really wanted to make this sort of a love letter to journalists because he feels like journalists are getting such a bad rap these days. I, I just feel like in some way he failed in that mission. Right. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm what I'm missing in terms of that, but it just I didn't. It didn't yeah. seem like that to me. It see, it, there's even no sense that there's any audience for the pictures they're taking. That's that was a, a feeling you got the, that the movie was creating at the same time mm -hmm. is that there's nobody out there when listening to the news anymore anyway. Right. You're hearing one side or the other. You're not listening to that type of journalism. Right. Mm -hmm. No, you have a, I mean, I have no memory of this, but even now when I look at still photography of Vietnam, it can like give me a chill. Now everything's video, it's like, you know, bombs falling. Live streams. Yeah, it's like something about the, what was, do you remember at all what the impact was of opening up a newspaper during Vietnam and just seeing like a picture? Was it like, and that, like that might be the only picture you would see. Now you can turn on the TV, you get so much, it's almost it just like washes over you. Hmm. Yeah, well, the, 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 some of the shots were, are famous and probably that woman might have taken them, but I remember, you know, there's, everybody remembers the one where the, you know, the guy, they're holding the gun up to the guy's head and mm -hmm. pulling the trigger and you see their head blowing off. And I, I saw that and, you know, and that's the kind of thing, I don't need to see that again. And when I saw it in on the theater, I don't, I don't, I just don't need to see that again. I'm, right. I already have a, an imagination. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what I, I mean, right. I, you're, I'm not, re, you're not creating any adrenaline here. I'm sorry. It uh, was probably like what he's alluding to with Vietnam, a pretty important role that the photojournalists were playing in terms of 
raising awareness back at home that ended up stopping the war because it was well, it's showing you what it looked like, right? right. Yeah, and, I mean, and, yeah. A, and a lot of them weren't grotesque war pictures. Just dudes sitting in a foxhole or something. You could just see the look on their face, like, "Get me the heck out of here!" You know, like, man, if y'all knew what was going on here, you would end this stuff right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I don't know, but that. I don't know that I can see where that helped in the war, but it sure didn't end it soon enough. Right. And it, it uh, went on. You know, there are people deciding which pictures to put on, which are too offensive, and I don't know. I know what you're saying, but I don't just question it. Right. Like now, like, like, if we all said, what did you see about the war, you know, wherever, you would have watched CNN. I would have watched CBS. You would have, I mean, you would have seen something on the internet. We don't even have a, a, a you know, we all seeing different things, and it all just washes away. I just wondered what the impact of a picture that everybody in the newspaper saw at one time. You know, just this was the image of war as hell or whatever. Well, uh, that happened with that picture I'm describing. That's mm -hmm. a famous picture. Anybody that saw it at that time was affected by it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that did happen, but I don't think it happened that often right. or that much. Uh, they didn't, and newspapers didn't very often put pictures like that in there. That I wonder where that picture actually showed up in first. And, mm -hmm. But it became famous, but, uh, you know, I don't know. A lot of that stuff that was happening in Vietnam was horrible and uh, to experience didn't make good pictures <laughs> and uh, you know I don't know wasn't gonna sell any books or anything right they were going to Time magazine I know a lot there was yeah. a lot a lot of those kind of periodicals were getting that kind of stuff they were going big with them full right. page double page spreads and stuff of like carnage. I mean, there was a point where they weren't holding back, but some of that stuff's very award winning, as graphic as it is. Mm -hmm. Well I'm not even talking about graphic ones. Like I just saw a picture a couple of days ago as World War Two, there's some guy sitting in a foxhole holding a cat. Hmm. It's like, oh my God, it's like some poor dude hadn't seen his family in a year and he just finds a cat like nothing more precious in the world to him right then. And just like to sit here holding this cat who's not trying to kill me. It's like, man, this is like such a powerful image. It's just not the pictures of dead people or anything, but just the image of, you know, you know, y'all are so fortunate not to be here type images. I feel, I feel like that's something that that we're we're all still processing because it <clears throat> you you would have hoped because photography and all and film and all that stuff were brand new inventions, right. and like maybe these inventions can enlighten us and show us the horrors of these things to make it so we'll never do them again. And it didn't. That obviously didn't work. Like, because we had World War Two, and you had these brave journalists bringing yeah. us the horrors, and there was still the belief that maybe through their brave actions, we'll never do that again. Right. Then Vietnam comes right. along and here we are again. And now we got what's going on in the Middle East. We got Ukraine, like n no amount of information seems to be able to snap us right. out of that, yeah. that base nature that is still completely willing to go there in terms of war and stuff. And it's almost, that's, that, that was the thing that it seemed to me so sad about that. If this is your love letter to journalism, it's it's also a like a almost a tombstone yeah. for the whole concept that they are are really changing the paradigm in any significant way. It's it's it's, it's sad to a certain. It, it's almost like the end of a certain innocence that mm -hmm. we all felt for so long that maybe through <laughs> acts of love and kindness and you and and it still feels possible. But then at the end of the day, it also seems really futile. Right. I, don't, I don't know what I'm saying there. You can oh. see it in the 60s, that whole innocence of, of believing that 
because there's this simple idea that if people just refuse to kill each other, it's the end of war. Right. And and maybe and the beautiful naivety of the '60s was like, screw all these leaders that are tra- right. that are that are sending all of our kids to war. Like if we just ignore if we just ignore them, disobey them, screw them, we could have world peace. Right. <clears throat> And and in that in that role, like the the nobility of the journalists, like showing us what the reality of the situation is, that no one would ever want any of this. I, I, I feel like I don't know. Well, maybe just I didn't even think about this. So you started with what you just said. Maybe his what his um, the honor and the nobility of the photo, photographers and journalists is. It got us sitting here talking about it. You know, so, you know, not that we any of us were for war, but, you know, if it can get people talking and thinking about it, maybe, you know, that is a, you know, a salute to all the people that get that information to us. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about how I, I felt, even as graphic as it was, I feel like it, it, it wasn't, it never really glorified war. Like, it was true kind of anti-war at heart. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he except, was scared. There was no heroes. Except for the media. They were hungry for the action. Oh, yeah. they, they went straight to it. They loved that it was going on. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like that was, like, to your point of the director's intention of this being a love letter to journalism, it's like, wouldn't that be painting them in a kind of a weird light that they're like, oh, we're glad these battles are happening. They're hoping that yeah. battle in the distance is still going on tomorrow yeah. so they can get close to it and get pictures of it. Almost glorifying battle, but n- no other aspect of the film, I think, to me, was glorifying war. Like some action movies like to do, mm-hmm. you know. Especially when you have a hero, the heroes and stuff. One thing I thought was interesting about the press notion is how, like, no matter what's going on, like, the idea of human nature that everybody, for the most part, almost everybody considers themselves the hero in their own narrative. No matter, And in that sense, the press is a little bit immune to everybody's... Higher because everybody that's a player in the war, no matter what side they're on, they they think of themselves as a hero, and they want the press to immortalize their even right. like the dudes at the gas station or whatever, right. or not take my picture. Right. Like, you know, like the the press was sort of a, a, a nonpartisan and immune to being threatened by anybody because everybody that was fighting thought of themselves as the hero and the press was there to document their right. her- heroism. Mm. And that gave the press the shield from almost anybody they met. Right. Which yeah. I always thought was an interesting dynamic. That mm-hmm. is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, 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 what you just said, that point was when the two snipers were, when they when they went to that, like, um, that weird amusement park thing and they ran over with the two snipers, the one guy's talking, the other guy's just very quietly sitting there then he fires one shot and he goes, well, that's taken care of or whatever. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like, y'all can just go on now right. <laughs> while y'all are talking bullshit. I sat here and took care of the problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that was an interesting scene in terms of what we were just talking about, too, and that they're like, mm-hmm. well, who's... What's going on here? Well, someone's trying to kill us, and we're trying to kill them. Right. No, no, they might have been on the same <laughs> side. The they, they have no idea who it is or right. why, or there's no ideology that they're fighting for in that moment. They're trying to kill us. We're trying to kill right. them. That's that's all that's really happening here. Do you want to give your presents out before it's too late? You got presents? Mm. I didn't know where there were presents. Uh, I, I went uh, walking the other day, and... Uh, I uh, found a yard sale on on my street, mm. and they were real Good old uh, yard sale. I haven't been to a yard sale in a long time, so I got presents. I got him a wonderful hat. <laughs> he he looks. Oh, is this the one he's wearing? <laughs> no, 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 no. I got him a. What is that? Uh, I got him Stand one of those rates. nice little hats. It's not a fedora. Or I don't know what they are. It's a beautiful it. hat. Yeah, but my it head's just, too big. Uh, didn't fit his head. <laughs> But it looked good, like a little top hat. Where, where is it? Is it in the bag still? Or? He no, did, he gave, but he didn't show you what he got, y'all. He said, well, oh, you gave Kyle his present off air. 
I gave it to him. He that left morning. it on the porch. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, um, but I have one for you, and I have one for Lex, and I have one for uh, Kethra. Wow. So you you. Uh, I should have got him spider. to wear his hat down here, but he was so <laughs> proud of his Stanton Braves hat. I was going to say, like, why didn't you wear your new hat? All it's right. like sits on top. It's like a. It's like a. It's a nice hat, but it just barely fits on top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you want uh, it? It comes in two parts. Okay. You want them both at the same time, or I don't you want, know. One at no, a time? I want to drag it out. One I want to milk it. Yeah, All right. right, so uh, close your eyes and okay. hold out your hand, and that's a gift I got you from the yard sale. What is? Oh, it? cool. Delta Command knife. <laughs> oh, why? How's this boy. still in the plastic wrap? What kind of yard sale is this? <laughs> They're selling new products. It, it was still in the. Look at that. I was joking the whole movie. I was like, well, "Don't worry. If, if if it all breaks out here, I got a pocket knife and two cans of tuna fish in my pocket." So. And I was lying. I did not have either of those things. Well, now you're halfway there. Look at that. I am halfway there. Yeah. That is cool. You put your eye out. Careful. Yeah, he had a whole box of them. Wow. If you want to go back and get some more. <laughs> a little hand grip on it and everything. Okay. Yeah. Not not too surprising, but hold up your hand, I'll give you the other one. Okay. <laughs> it's not anything. But, uh, <laughs> what, what could it be? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's a knife. <laughs> it's another one. <laughs> Wait, what is this one, though? I don't know. I just thought they were weird. Rescue folder. You just thought they were weird. <laughs> you got anything weird my son would like? That's what I asked you. Rescue <laughs> folder? That's what it says. It just says rescue folder. That's what every computer needs. Oh, this one feels way... This, oh. is, a, this is different. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's like a fish What is that? Yeah, something. what is that? It's a fish scraper for one thing. It does look mm. like a fish scraper. I feel like... Anybody ever see anything like that? Is that legal to be selling knives on the street? <laughs> yeah. You don't want to get your neighbor in trouble. What kind of operation are they running over there? This is new. You want, you want some, something more powerful? Come run back. <laughs> John Huggins, welcome to the show. Good to see your name. Now, this one from Lex is pretty special. Uh -huh. Now, I got Kethra's in here. Let me, let me hide Kethra's. Here's yours. All right. Is this a fish thing? I think you could definitely. Oh, remember. no way. <laughs> yeah, baby. Look oh, at that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that is uh, awesome. What? He was selling that at the yard sale. Yeah. Was a, what kind of yard sale? <laughs> yard, sale. The yard sale. Yard sale. Yard <laughs> sale score. <laughs> Look at that. I don't even understand what's going on I, here. I've actually seen this in the grocery store, though. Really? Yeah. Did you go to Costco? Or yard I've sale? never heard oh, of that. But, I mean, it's a collectible. I it, mean, it's never been opened. Yeah, let it's let gonna, I'm going to collect it right here. <laughs> <laughs> with vanilla cream filling yes you oh got some milk <laughs> it's actually creamy it's... i have no idea i haven't had it yet but i'm very excited about it oh my about goodness <laughs> i'll eat a bowl of that with, with both Living sides of my mouth rich. but to our point that week not a toy inside. <laughs> not a toy. Yeah. Nothing, oh. nothing inside. Well, they don't even pretend like there's something fun in they there. They got but. that sweet vanilla cream, but nothing to play with. He's I, mean, probably, I mean, there's a crown on the back that you can cut out, maybe. He's probably got a knife in there. You never know. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, give me the box Steve. for a That's second. That's super thoughtful. That's I thought of very you immediately. Fun. <laughs> I thought of you immediately. That's awesome. That's funny. I'm looking for the date. Just out of curiosity. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, it's, but it's uh, had it. September this year. It was so, like yeah. a collective. Uh, he had it so out. So what, did, was there a plot or a theme to his yard sale? Or what no, was it was two different families, so uh, there were a lot of different things. There were a lot of children's things. I got okay. a couple things for the Still kids. in the packaging? Was there anything <laughs> used? Oh, yeah, thing? most of it was used. Oh, but there was this one section that the one guy had that, he was just trying to get rid of his, everything. And, his uh, inventory from his store or something. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> location, <laughs> location. Well, the knives. He had lots of knives. I'm going to have to Google that because that is a very particular tool for I don't know what job yet. It's yeah. for rescuing something, I think. A rescue folder. It even says here. 
black coated stainless steel blade with serrated blade, like rounded tip, blade. and thumb pull. So like maybe for thumb like pull. cutting loose something like if you're it's not sharp what huh. it's not sharp famous last words i know <laughs> I, I, I had that panic moment i'm like but check it out oh. show it close to the screen for a second in case anybody out there has any insight for me john huggins it looks like you worked out at the dock you it is sharp that. it is sharp see if you can cut that cord holding you to the computer with it what on earth is that for? All you knife experts, let us know. That's not a knife. If anybody knows how to shrink my head, let me know too so I can get the hat on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they ought to be able to make hats bigger. It's got the clip on the side. You should just go around with both of them hooked to your belt from now on. Let people know you're not playing around. That's nice. Rambo survives. That's all we got in the chat so far. I'll take it. That's cool. First blood. It's very lightweight. Man. You, you can hook that on your sock. I got one, one free chip it. here. Oh, they, those are good ones to put down here on your boot or I something. I know, man. Yeah. <laughs> Henry Bowman. <laughs> hook, it, hook it to the back of your shirt. Something happens. <laughs> mm. Or if you have to rescue somebody. Well, wow. oh. I know what song I want to do for the leaving song, but I don't know how it goes. There's an old amusement song called War Song that would be perfect, but I don't... What is a good for? I, I, would, I would just, right, <laughs> I would just uh, um, not remember how it goes. It would be one of those duds. Soldier? If anybody's, oh. gonna, if anybody's gonna go see the movie, I hope we didn't ruin it for you. Marching, want me to start a beat? No. Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> the whole other breakout here. <laughs> Version of marching. It just says, a, we only talked about the first 20 minutes of the movie, so we didn't tell you anything that comes out after the first 20 minutes. Oh yeah, we did. <laughs> did we talk about anything we liked about it? I like that it wasn't incredibly long. It didn't feel long. I didn't days. get tired. Right. I, I liked I, it, but I was disturbed by it. Mm -hmm. as, but as far as like that, it never dragged or I never no. got tired. I never, I wasn't about to fall asleep or anything. It, it kept me and it didn't seem long at all with a lot of movies are like god wouldn't you said the last half hour for you was a little drawn out but it was well, very bombastic yeah one, like, one of the yeah. things i found funny they were showing that and then like a godzilla movie like i, <laughs> I wonder what the difference was oh in the other the theater with yeah. godzilla <laughs> oh really mm. you know this the the guy that made this movie all of his other movies are sort of sci-fi dystopian story 28 days later he wrote that oh, you ever seen that, that? yeah i like that one and uh x machina you ever seen that mm -hmm. about the ai robot lady so he definitely like dystopian end of the world kind of stuff mm -hmm. is sort of his genre which is sort of interesting um gosh that was a good idea lex i'm afraid i'd I don't know what songs I remember anymore. I'm afraid to even start one. That's that's one of the reasons I was talking to someone last night about starting to live stream singing songs again. It's just been a while. To, one of the main reasons I want to do it is well, not only do I miss performing, but the, I miss just knowing how my songs go. I was like, I, I miss the, the way I said it was... I, I miss them being so close to the surface that if they go unplayed, they sink. And I, I go to reach for them, like bobbing for apples, and it's <clears throat> the depth can be a, an illusion, and I can't reach them anymore. I'll just, I'll just start singing a song and be like, oh, it's been too long. I don't completely remember how it goes. <clears throat> Only written a thousand songs. So. Hey, then I, I should st just stop. Stop writing them. I 
All right, soldier, rock and roll. Can win the war just sitting. He's off on another tour. No one believes in the mission and in writing to his worried wife. He tells her not to worry life. Just happened. Oh, this. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Check, check, check. It's here for the actual so, producer, Nathan Moore. <laughs> so where where did you where did you lose sound? Ah, we don't need to finish that. Shaking my soul, shaking my soul, grooving that shovel, 
Taking it slow, taking it slow. Sharing in the trouble, sharing in the trouble. Sharing in the pain, sharing in the pain. Oh, we can't just lock loneliness away. Oh, we can't just lock loneliness away. Peace of change. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> I, I just peed my pants over here. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Give peace a chance. I did not pee my pants. Thank you very much. Who peed their pants? Somebody had a good question. Uh, they said uh, a plot has an arc. Does life have an arc? I mean, yeah, it does. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. Who it wrote, does even if nothing happens. Who wrote that? You start that? out a baby. You learn how to speak and walk and stuff, and then you no, become a, pl- a baby a, yeah, again a plot. at the end. Who's, who's <laughs> Restream Bot? Oh, John Dodson. A plot usually has an arc. Does life have an arc? I definitely think the, the, the more interesting plot arcs of a life are the little adventures along the way, not just the grand thing, but... That's what my friend said. The best part of the plot that gets left off is the little things you do that don't ever really amount. Like you don't think is a grand thing, but mean the most to you when you lay in there at the end of your life. Yeah, like, how about that? Yeah. Right. That makes perfect sense. Catherine just chimed in on the chat. Oh, that must have been oh, when you, you asked where you left off. You talked about streaming again and went mute, kind of like the old days. <laughs> But it had him. No, I think it was like during the commercial. Or I mean when we when I held the box out. Are we off now? <laughs>